All right. Um, I have been on something of a Nebbiolo kick. Uh, I don't... Not for any particular reason. I guess if I had to pick a reason, I would just say sort of because Nebbiolo is really, really cool. Uh, Nebbiolo isn't considered... I don't think it's considered a noble grape. It's not really considered an international grape, you know. It's really just grown in Italy, just grown in Piedmont. Um, but when you talk about the great wines of the world... Wait, let me put the bottle and glass down so that I can do this. Great wines of the world. Um, Barbaresco and Barolo are right up there at the top of the list. Uh, uh, you know, along with, like, Left Bank Bordeaux and... Palm Bar I'm not going to get into all the other stupid things that are on that list of great wines of the world. I feel like I should have a tweed jacket with elbow patches and stuff on to be talking about them. Anyway... Um, yeah, so I've been on this Nebbiolo kick, because Barolo and Barbaresco get a lot of attention, and there are some cool ones out there, but there's a ton of other great Nebbiolos from around Piedmont. Piedmont is a very interesting, uh, like, geographically interesting place. It's a large place. It's got a lot of land, um, a lot of different, slightly different culturally, you know, cities and parts of it, from sort of plains to hills in the Long Gay, and then you go north, if you keep going north, you get up here to Boca and Gattinara. Um, you get up to these really high elevation Appalachians that are really up in the mountains. I'm looking, there's a tiny little stupid map on the back of here. Actually, I bet, I bet it'll even come through there. I'll try and hold it still. So you can see where this comes from, Grignasco. Grignasco is a town right next to... Boca is also actually a town, but so this is right next to the town of Boca, within the DOC of Boca. Um, this is, like, way up there in northern Piedmont, up in the, like, the beginnings of the real mountains. Like, it's actually not that far from the Matterhorn. <laughs> I was looking at it on Google Maps, and I was like, whoa, oh, that's way up there. That is way north of Asti, way north of Milan. Like, that's that's up there, close to the border. Um, so this is 85% Nebbiolo, 15% a grape called Vespolina, uh, aged for, fermented in, uh, I believe, stainless steel, on the skins for 20, 20 days, okay? Um, then aged, I believe, for three months to kind of let it settle, and then it goes into 20 uh, hectoliter Slovenian oak, casks for two years um, before being bottled and then aged in bottles. So uh, I believe 2011 is the current vintage right now. They might be on to 2012, but still, uh, the wine gets held back a long time. So this is made by this guy, De Davide Carlone, uh, whose roots here go back to like the mid-1800s. Uh, his great-grandfather started making wine. At one point, Boca almost went extinct as an Appalachian. Uh, back in the 80s when he started farming grapes, he was one of only two people still growing grapes and making wine in Boca. Uh, like a lot of other places in Italy, like Mount Etna, there used to be a ton of people here working the land um, because it's a, well, because people got to eat and drink wine. But as mechanization happened and people moved to the cities, a lot of the like difficult places to live, a lot of the hilly, mountainous parts, everybody left. Um, the area up here around Boca and Gattinara, that was one of those places where basically everybody left. Um, so there's all these old vineyards that have turned into forest. Uh, he started farming grapes when he was in his late teens. I believe at this point he has, Davide has about 1.8 hectares of grapes for vineyard in Boca. Um, he just kept on going the entire time and helped keep the Appalachian alive, taught other people, you know, helped farm grapes for other people to kind of like help other producers get going as other people slowly started to come in. Um, you know, cleared a lot of trees to keep, keep vineyards alive there. So anyway, high elevation Nebbiolo from, from way northern Piedmont. It is floral, like, like I sort of expect Nebbiolo to be. But it's not as, 
pretty. It's not as like clear and perfumey as some. It actually has a little bit more power in the aroma. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting mix of like lilacs. kind of like wild cherry. Nebbiolo is an interesting, like aromatically really interesting grape. That's why I've been on this damn Nebbiolo kick. Mmm. Oh, man. The minerality. Oh, it's like salty and just wakes your palate up. The tannins aren't that aggressive, which is really cool because Nebbiolo, you know, can be like, uh, strip the enamel off your teeth kind of tannic. Um, what was I going to say? Right, yeah, okay, Boca, this is interesting. The subsoil here is volcanic. The topsoil is like calcareous clay, but then you go underneath that and the, like, the reason that it's so mountainous and hilly here is that this, there it used to be a range of volcanoes. Um, so the subsoil here is actually volcanic, which is really, really interesting to me, really unusual, um, changes, changes the character of the land. Yeah. Oh, it's really interesting. The aroma is, is pretty. It's floral. And then on the palate, it's powerful and quite structured. You get, um, like, mineral, I'll just gesture, gesticulate, I'm trying to be more Italian with all these things in my hands. You get, like, salty minerality on the mid-palate that really, like, binds everything together and stuff. And then you get the tannins that come in on the finish, and the tannins are totally accessible. They're not, like, aggressive or, or bitter. They're, um, they just kind of, like, draw the finish out. They help kind of, like hold the fruit together and kind of keep it in place, keep it from being too fruity or juicy or pretty. They make the wine more interesting and savory. It's a tiny bit. They talk about Nebbiolo being tarry. I wouldn't quite call this tarry, but it's a little bit like um, toasty, like a little bit like charry, like uh like a, you know, steak that's been seared on the grill and it's tender and juicy on the inside here, mid palate and stuff. But there's this exterior, like charred kind of savory, burnt also character there that, that gives this added dimension. And the wine has that. This, this wine has like, um, a, an earthy, um, dark kind of, kind of quality there around the fruit. Mm. The pieces are all very integrated right now. Um, it's had enough time that it seems like it's really come together. It's still ripe and juicy and powerful, uh, but the components of the wine have been knit together very well. So it's sort of like this is, Nebbiolo is super long lived. This tastes like it will be a very long lived wine. But to me, this is like the wine is just coming into its own. Uh, there's nothing oxidative about this yet. So this is a wine that is like very good right now, but I think it would be more interesting maybe in like, another five or six years, something like that. Like this, it's still young. It's not going to be, to me, it's it's very good right now, but it's not actually going to be at its peak. Um, interesting complexity-wise for maybe another six years, and then it's going to go through probably several evolutions, several like steps after that, too. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, so yeah, this is Old Vine, um, organically farmed, wild fermented, no mechanical tilling, no pesticides, uh, what else is there none of? No filtration, 
um, just cold stabilization. And uh, the vines are trained on chestnut poles. They grow up chestnut poles. They're tied on with willow branches. That's the old, 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 old school way of doing it. Uh, old school vine tying all across, I don't know, from like central Italy up through northern Italy, every, like where I go, you know, that's the old school way that they would do it in vineyards. They'd use, um, you know, thin little new willow branches soaked in water to tie vines onto whatever they were training them on. But yeah, so this, the vines are, they're not using wires or any kind of trellis system. They're just tying them onto um, chestnut poles and letting them grow up the poles. Uh, very old school, very good. And this is, you know, so this is really special, interesting, handmade wine of a place. And this is a good, I don't know, 40% less than Barolo or Barbaresco. This is, this is, this is about as expensive as some of the pricier Longue Nebbiolos out there. Um, to put it in some kind of perspective, this this would be like I don't know, low to mid thirties retail, where for Barolo and Barbaresco, you know, you're talking forty dollars, maybe something like that for the for the very beginning entry level, some of the wines. So this is a pretty awesome value. This is a special, unique wine. Most people have no idea that Boca exists or what it is. But it is really, really worth exploring and checking this out. So, Davide Carlone, Boca, Nebbiolo, Vita Vespoline.